Mohammed. <laughs> Marcus, welcome to uh, Somali Studies. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, first of all, just for the benefit of our uh, audience, can you just quickly introduce you, yourself and, and your background, please? Yeah, um, so I'm Markus Hune, I'm a German student of social anthropology and uh, I have been working on Somali affairs since I would say 2001 when I did my MA thesis. I wrote my M I started writing my MA thesis in 2001 on uh, strategies of peaceful conflict settlement uh, at the local and international level. And um, I took as an example Somalia as a whole. But that, that study was based on literature only, so I never had gone anywhere to Africa before that time. And um, so when I did my MA uh, on that and I read a lot of uh, historical, anthropological and political works on Somalia, uh, I realized that it's a very interesting place and it's uh, quite diverse also, politically speaking. I, I got news that it was the first time I learned about that things are different in southern Somalia and in northern Somalia. I learned about Somaliland and I learned about Puntland. It was the time of the Arta Peace Conference, like Arta was just closed and there was this new government uh, in, in place. So I, uh, so it was all quite interesting and then I thought after I finished my MA that uh, I should actually look at the situation with my own eyes. And uh, in Germany I met a Somali from the north, from Somaliland, and he invited me and said, why don't you come to our gate so you can stay in my house I will, and you can look at things yourself. So I did that in 2002, in summer 2002, that was the first time I went anywhere to Africa. So Somaliland was my first destination, but it was also my first time in Africa. Okay. Um, so where did you, um, why did you exactly choose that area, um, not South Somalia, for example? Well, yeah, that, that was a pragmatic uh, reason that uh, it was the most peaceful area to do, to, to in, 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 the, in, in, in the Somali territories. So Somaliland was most peaceful. I was also quite interesting, interested in these state formation dynamics. You know, like you had Somaliland on the one hand, then I had learned about Puntland when I was in the region. I had learned that there was a conflict in Seoul and Sanak region over, is it actually Somaliland? Is it Puntland? Is it Somalia? And I thought that would be really an interesting topic, like a micro study of state formation and identity formation. And Somalia, the rest of Somalia, or southern Somalia, was not quite there. I mean, that was a time when you had the Arta government, you had the warlords, you had this uh, coalition of warlords uh, against Arta, if you remember, led by Abdullah Yusuf and uh, Hussein Aidid and Omar Chess and these people uh, who, who were actually supported by Ethiopia against uh, Abdikasim, I think, Abdikasim Salat Hassan. And so it was, the political situation in South and Somalia was not, uh, con it was not benefiting for me. I mean, it was not peaceful and it was, uh, it was an ongoing conflict. Uh, whereas in, in Northern Somalia, I had the feeling, yeah, I could really do some substantial socio-anthropological socio work on these interesting dynamics. Okay. Um, I hope uh, it pans out very well for you. Uh, as you can see, we've You've had uh, a lot of material written on that area. Yeah. Uh, you sit in so many uh, uh, panels as an advisor, and you you've written uh, a lot of uh, as an expert expert researcher in that area. A lot of uh, material on that, which is very beneficial material to read. Mm. You've also co-edited um, several books mm. in, in in accumulation of, of the, in, in 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 terms of that area and the works you've done. Uh, such as uh, 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 cooperating with uh, the late Virginia. Can you just tell us a bit more about uh, uh, that work? Virginia so, Luling? Yeah, to sort of to honor her as well and her contribution. Yeah, no, that is uh, very good. No, I, I learned, uh, Virginia, uh, I think I learned uh, uh, her personally in 2005. We met on a conference in London. And ever since we had been in contact, and she was so kind to introduce me to all kinds of interesting Somalia-related things. And I appreciated uh, her work since she did really from a very uh, from early on. She always took on issues which have been completely under-researched in Somali studies. I mean, she did her long-term research in Afgoye on people who are not the politically dominant group, like uh, uh, Geledi, Begedi. She knew a lot about Asharaf and other groups, uh, which are not, you know, politically um, dominant in, in Somalia. Even historically, their history has often been ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, it was often the history of the strong groups 
and uh, uh, and the culture of the strong groups, which was making the headlines or which which made it into the articles and the books. So she took these issues on. And she has, I don't know if you know, she has a very beautiful article in 1984, it's called uh, The Other Somali, which came out in, in Proceedings of a Somali Study Conference, which happened in, in, in Hamburg in, in the 1980s, early 1980s, which is, a, I mean, up to this day, actually, one of the best articles on Somali minority groups, or so-called minority groups, if you like, mm -hmm. their history, their culture, their situation. So, and she did that in the 80s. So she was, in my perspective, she was always somebody who took on very interesting issues which haven't, which have been ignored by others. Um, and she was extremely dedicated. She, 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 she really loved Somalis. She loved Somalia. She loved Somali culture. And uh, and she was an extreme sincere scholar, I would say, mm -hmm. who never took things lightly, and she was always questioning herself, and she was really making great effort to to produce accurate accounts of Somali culture and history. So I admired that she was very meticulous in her work. So she was not very prolific, as you know, she didn't publish hundreds of articles and books, but what she has published it was of high quality and she had a very deep knowledge. So anyway, I, I saw her like as a teacher friend, mm -hmm. um, and then at one point I knew that she has been, personally, she had been a PhD student of, of Ewan Lewis uh, in the 1960s and 70s in, in London, and um, then I, I, I also came to know Ewan Lewis, and of course he is somebody who has done a very important work in Somali studies. I mean, if you read his old his early books, like starting with People of the Horn of Africa, which came out in 1955, and then of course uh, Pastoral Democracy, which came out in 1961. I mean, these are still extremely rich accounts of Somali history, politics, and culture. So um, I know that in Somali studies, he is sometimes criticized for his positions, and I think there are also sometimes good reasons to criticize him. But I think at the same time, one shouldn't, in German, we, we say you shouldn't throw out the child with the bathwater, right? So um, there are things which are still very important, which he has done, and still, you know, some you can still learn a tremendous amount from his early work. Yeah. And though we said, since she was a student of his, and I was kind of an admirer of his, uh, uh, we said, okay, he's becoming 80 very soon, in 2010, he, it was his 80th birthday. So we sat together and thought we make this kind of Festschrift, which is actually a German tradition, in, a tradition in German academia, but obviously it also uh, has found its way into the British uh, academia, because you have the term in, in English even Festschrift, which is a German word. So it's basically a book which honors uh, a, a, a well-established scholar, and um, so we got together a lot of people. We sent emails around to like dozens of people, and we got a lot of interesting replies, good replies actually. And so we 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 took this uh, this work on together, and this was where we became really close, Virginia and I. But going further uh, to uh, the, the, the 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 core of the interview, um, could you please briefly uh, recount for us the historical context of? Of, of, of the area that you uh, um, research on, what is known as British Somaliland, i.e. Seoul, Sanax, uh, Puntland, Somaliland, that sort of area. Now, yeah, as you know, I mean, the, 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 the colonial history of, of northern Somalia, I mean, it began in a way before before it became really militarized. It, it began in, in it began in the in the early 19th century with uh, with the with the, the construction of the Suez Canal, Suez Canal, which was uh, I think the construction work or the work began in in 1839, and um, it was concluded in I think 30 years later in 1869, and. Um, with this project, the whole region of the Horn of Africa became strategically very important because you know it opened the route from the Mediterranean Sea through the Gulf of Aden to the Indian Ocean to India, basically. So um, everybody became really interested. I mean, everybody in Europe, I would say, the French, the Germans, um, Germans not yet, but the French and the British particularly, they were competing in those days. So um, with this project of uh, the Suez Channel, they, uh, um, the Horn of Africa really uh, became interesting for European imperial powers and then colonialism, European colonialism set in in the late 19th century, as we all know, with the scramble for Africa. It also had an Ethiopian side, as you know, an Abyssinian yeah. side with Menelik II, who um, very early on established himself 
as like an African colonialist, I would say, um, he must have been a very intelligent man. I mean, he, he, he sensed that if he doesn't take a very strong position, his empire will also become eventually a colony. Um, so very early on, he set the record straight, and there was the Battle of uh, Adua, um, where Ethiopian forces actually defeated Italian colonial forces. It must have been in 1896. Um, that was the first time ever this happened in, in Africa and uh, it, uh, it really established the Ethiopians as an African colonial power in the region, I would say. And uh, I mean, as you, as you know, the, 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 the border lines have been drawn over a longer period of time. I think there have been various agreements, whatever, Anglo-French agreement, uh, which established the border between what is Somaliland and Djibouti, Anglo-Ethiopian agreement, which established the border between Somaliland and Abyssinia, mm -hmm. must have been around 1894. And then the Anglo-Italian agreement, which established the border between the so so Italian Somali part, which is today from Puntland to the south, to uh, between uh, Italian Somaliland and uh, British Somaliland. And this was, I think, in, must have been in 1908 or 1904, I think 1904 probably. Um, so um, this borderline in the east of Somaliland, of the British protectorate, this is also the one which is still contested up until today uh, in the region of Seoul and Sanak. And now I want to ask you the context of uh, the unification of, mm -hmm. of British Somaliland and Italian Somaliland. Uh, did, was there a, a, a basically a, some sort of a problematic uh, issues that developed from this unification? Mm. Or did everything basically happen like, you know, kumbaya, you know, everything was <laughs> wonderful? <laughs> yeah, of, of course that's it's... A, a that's, a, that's a narrative that we get a lot. We get it a lot. The Somali uh, unification was so good and everybody has that drums, but is it really? Hmm. No, I think it, it, like with history, you always have to be careful uh, how it's getting interpreted at various times. Though uh, what I find fascinating, if you look at, at the time, like in the 1950s probably, you would see that there was a very strong Somali nationalism uh, in place all over the Horn of Africa, I would say, all over the Somali inhabited Horn of Africa. And you have people like S Sultan Timo Ade, who is actually from the north, who uh, I, I once had the chance to read uh, some of his early poetry, uh, a guy called uh, Bobe, Bobe Yusuf uh, Bobe, who is uh, based in Hargeisa. He collected uh, the poetry of uh, Sultan Timo Ade. And if you read through the earlier work of, of this very famous Somali poet, then you see that he was such a strong nationalist. And he expressed, I think, like Somali poets do in general, he expressed a few of the masses, mm -hmm. right? So these, these uh, they have the gift to take up important issues and, and frame them in a very artistic and beautiful way and entertain people but also express political views. And I think Sultan Timo Ade was not the only political poet of, of his time and of, his, of this region of Somalia, but um, he was uh, maybe the most famous one. Mm -hmm. And if you read the, his work from the 1950s, you see that there was actually a strong anti-colonialism, anti-British uh, sentiment in the area. There was a very strong nationalism in the area, particularly in the north of Somalia, which then actually swept all across the Somali territories. And I think when the unification happened in, on 1st of July 1960, it was a big celebration, of course. It was, everybody was really happy and ideologically or emotionally people, uh, uh, I think, would, I would say 99% of all Somalis were uh, deeply satisfied. There have been a couple of cautious voices. You know that there has been this uh, Hispul, uh, this, there was a party in, uh, in southern Somalia which uh, was maybe dominated by Digil and Merifle, which was a bit more careful about the idea of immediate unification. I think they had the proposition that there should be kind of a federation first and then after some time people should discuss a unification. And I think also in Somaliland, in the British Protectorate, there was also, were also some personalities who advocated for a bit more careful approach. But uh, the vast uh, majority of Somalis, the politicians and, politicians and also the ordinary people, they were just rushing into, into unification between Somaliland or British Somaliland and Italian Somaliland. And uh, um, as, as you always have it, like after, after the party is over, then the headache comes, I guess. And then um, 
people realized already in, 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 in 61, 1961 that things are actually have not been well prepared. Yeah. So there was a lot of complications when it came to the administration, when it came to the different you know, traditions of administration, the British tradition, the Italian tradition, when it came to education, when it came also to power sharing. So there, there were, I, I, I think also historically speaking, very early on people sensed that something has not been done well. Again, Sultan Timo Ada, I think already in 1961, so just one year after unification, uh, I created a poem which points at these difficulties. I think I remember there was um, there was, I think, the Somali Prime Minister visiting Hargeisa in 61 and Sultan Timo Ade was among the welcoming committee and he, he performed a poem uh, in which he uh, already mentioned that things are not going as we were hoping in Somalia and that the political class basically should rethink its, 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 its strategy. So I think you could see early on there was already these, uh, these problems, but nevertheless, I think the majority of Somalis remained just uh, Somali Wayne or nationalists, mm -hmm. and uh, they even tolerated these complications. There has been a small revolution or attempted coup in, in, in northern Somalia, I think, in, in late 61, mm -hmm. which was aborted. So, why was it aborted? I mean, it was Hassan Kate, Kate and, and these people who were military uh, officers in the north. Uh, why didn't they succeed? I think they, they didn't succeed because the majority of the people, even in, in Somaliland or in northern in Somalia were not willing to give up the idea of unification. So they were criticizing the way how power was divided and they were probably criticizing other things but I think nobody in those days seriously doubted the idea or questioned the idea of Somali win. Why is there a, a, a sort of animosity between Somaliland and Puntland in terms of where the border lies and who defines this border by the way? Yeah, I think in my perspective, this uh, dispute between Somaliland and Puntland is not over territory. Mm -hmm. It's about political vision. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, it's also not about resources or something. I mean, things, these things come up more recently, um, but uh, the, the, the dispute between Somaliland and Puntland, in my reading, is essentially about the question of what is the future of Somalia? Is there a kind of a you know, divided? solution like Somaliland as an independent country and the rest of Somalia as an independent country or is it like at least the reconstruction of what has been Somalia between 1960 and 1991. So um, I think that's the, 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 the core of this dispute and that's also why this dispute is so complicated I would say because um, if it would be just about where the line is going and you know, which territory uh, is included in Somaliland, which territory is in included in Puntland, then you could eventually probably find a solution I think. If it's just a, it would be just a re if it would be just a readjustment of, of the border lines so to say then this can can be negotiated. It has been negotiated in Sudan, South Sudan and North Sudan. It has been negotiated in other places, Eritrea and, uh, and Ethiopia. Um, but I think this, this, um, the problem with Somaliland and, uh, and, and Puntland is that Puntland sees itself, and this also actually in the Puntland constitution, it sees itself as a representative of the Somali Republic. So, um, and uh, in, in the absence of a strong Somali government in Mogadishu, Puntland, and that already was the idea in 1998 when Puntland was established, Puntland is kind of guarding the rights of Somalia. And uh, in this sense, it could not let go Somaliland with its uh, session, mm -hmm. right? And Somaliland is kind of trying, and that's, in my perspective, that's really kind of a very, um, a very interesting twist in, 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 in modern history that Somaliland, as, you, as we also said before, Somaliland was actually the area where Somali nationalism or Somali wane, the idea of Somali wane was very strong mm -hmm. in the 1950s and also 1960s. And it is now, or it became then in the 1990s, the area where the idea of Somali wane was buried. Mm -hmm. And if you see the Somaliland flag, mm -hmm. you have the black star in the flag. So the black star, as you, as you know, is actually the, the, the sign of, of the death of the Somali Wayne idea. Mm -hmm. So um, it has been the cradle of Somali nationalism and no, also it has been basically the burial ground of Somali nationalism in a way, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so 
I think this, this dispute is eventually over the idea of, of what Somalia should look like in the future. Okay. Seoul and Sanak, or what is known as Khartoum Estate, has been caught in the middle in, in, in terms of what's going on mm. in, in Somaliland uh, political uh, aspiration uh, in terms of its secession and Puntland's uh, uh, political ambition mm -hmm. in terms of being a guardian of what is Somali federal government. And Khartoum state who is actually not seceding, but who is also a not uh, strong uh, key player as, as Puntland, is somewhat in the middle of, 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 of this sort of uh, infringement. Um, so who really has the final say, practically, because the Somali federal government is, is not there to, to assist them in terms of their own identity mm. as a federal state? Here I would like to say a few more words. Let me start with the history of, uh, of, of this uh, Khatumu state, so to say. I mean, the, the, how, what led actually to the formation of Khatumu? Because I think this has been very badly understood, probably also among many other Somalis, but also among other area specialists. So um, you have this long-standing dispute between Somaliland and Puntland over this area. So why is there this dispute? Because Somaliland claims the borders of the British Protectorate, and Puntland claims to be the representative of all the Harti in the region. So, and the Dulbahante and Warsangili living in the regions Somali, uh, Sanak and Seoul, and also around Buhotle, they basically fulfill both requirements. Though their territory is within the borders of the former British Protectorate, but genealogically speaking, they belong to the Harti uh, 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 descent, descent group. Um, and those guys, according to my experiences in the area, they deliberately did not decide to whom to belong. Mm -hmm. So like, from a very pragmatic point of view, you could go to Las Arnot, you could go to Buhotle, you could go to Teleh, mm -hmm. you could go to Baran, and ask people, so what do you want? Do you want Somaliland or do you want to be Puntland? So just decide and then take a side in order to finish these complications. And the, what people told me actually in the region is, that they deliberately didn't decide because they want, they want to keep both of them together, they want to be in the middle. Of course, some people would say, okay, they're gaining something from Hargeisa and they're gaining something from Garoue. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there are some Warsangili and Dulbahante politicians in Somaliland and there are Warsangili and Dulbahante positions in Puntland. So, um, um, but I think it's not only for economic gain, it's not only for the gain of political power because you know, things in Hargeisa are very often decided by other people, not by Warsangili and not by Dubahante, and things in Garoue are also decided by other people. We all know uh, what I mean. Um, but I think it, many people in these regions told me that de facto they, they want to make sure that neither Somaliland nor Puntland is going astray. So they want to keep Somali, Somalia together. Yeah. So um, this led to a situation where there was you know, nobody really wanted to invest in this area. Neither Hargeisa thought, neither Hargeisa trusted these people, nor Garoue really trusted these people. And even the diaspora, Dulbahante diaspora, Warsangili diaspora, they didn't invest much in these places because they always thought it's, it's an unstable area. Uh, we never know where it's going, though they put their money somewhere else and not in this area. And this was the situation in the early 2000s when I came to this region. Though it was pretty marginal areas, marginalized areas with uh, no, no development actually, but also no military conflict yet. Mm -hmm. Though the people who were running uh, the business in Seoul and Sanak and the area around Buhatla were traditional authorities. Mm -hmm. Garado, Isimada, the way Isimada. So um, it was a very interesting area of no governance, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah? So things have changed in 2003, 2004, when uh, Somaliland and Puntland were actually trying to enforce their claims to the area. And they sent military troops to the area. Then first Puntland occupied Las Arnot for a short period of time. And Somaliland occupied Las Arnot, which is the capital of Seoul region. And most of this conflict then has been developing in the Dulbahante areas. The Warsangili area stayed a little bit out of this com so complication. So when you say occupied, does that mean there was an armed struggle that took place where they two, the two parties came together and fought? 
Um, when when Puntland actually was taken over as Arno, that was in December 2003, there was no real armed struggle. There was no resistance. The Puntland forces came to town. I was in Las Arno at the time. The Puntland forces came to town and there was no Somaliland presence anyway. Um, so um, they just occupied the place and the local population was in agreement. Mm -hmm. Some people were not really happy because they were expecting a counter reaction by Somaliland and they were actually quite right. But most people like Genealogically speaking, they said Wawalalo. So, Waskarti. So, um, Somaliland reacted, of course, and they sent their troops in January, February 2000, uh, 2004 to an area called Ari Adeye. It's a small village, uh, 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers uh, e uh, um, east, uh, west of Las Arnold. Mm -hmm. And then this conflict boiled up until there was a military clash in October. It must have been in October 2000. Uh, for after Abdullah, uh, just after Abdullah Yusuf had been elected president of the transitional federal government in Kenya, um, and you know he was a hearty hardliner, yeah. so I think he was instigating this clash to some degree as far as he could. Probably, I'm not 100 percent sure of it, but anyway, this clash happened shortly after he had been elected uh, president of Somalia, and um, from then on the situation remained like a military confrontation mm -hmm. for several years. And Puntland kept control over parts of Seoul, including Las Arnot, and parts of Sanak, including some of the Warsangili territories, and Somaliland controlled the rest. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think Puntland didn't really do a very good job in controlling and administrating the area, also developing the area. There was no real development happen happening in this time. Mm -hmm. And then there was, a, you know, there was a complicated internal crisis in Puntland in 2006-2007 when, um, uh, when um, um, Musa Ade, mm -hmm. Ade Musa, sorry, Ade Musa was president of Puntland, and I think he didn't really pay much attention to this conflict. He was much more conf uh, con uh, concentrated on developing core, the core area of Puntland, the Machetin territories, and particularly his area around Bosaso, and he was interested in resource expo extraction and resource exploitation in, in, in the territory around Bosaso. Um, he did develop those things, and uh, he didn't really pay much attention to this uh, to this conflict zone. And uh, at one point, he fell out with his interior minister, uh, who was called um, um, Ahmed Abdi Hashi, I think. He was a Dulba Hunter, a very senior Dulba Hunter politician. And then this led to all kinds of com complications. Eventually, uh, the former interior minister of Puntland changed sides. He switched to Somaliland again. And he led the troops of Somaliland, together with a couple of other uh, colleagues, uh, into the area. And they took over Las Arnot. But there was no real battle over Las Arnot. The Puntland troops just retreated. So they retreated to a place called Tukarak, which is, uh, uh, which is east of Las Arnot and um, on the way to Garoe, and the Somaliland troops took over the, the control over the city. However, then in November 2007, you had fighting in Las Arnot going on between Dulba Hunter militias and some, some militias which were against the Somaliland forces and some militias we were, which were in favor of the Somaliland forces. So why do I tell you all this long winded story? Because this, in, in, in fall 2007, in October, November 2007, this was a decisive moment which gave rise to the establishment of SSC, Sol Sanak and Ain, which then turned into Khatumu State. Why? Because the local population, they never want to be militarily controlled by Somaliland forces. They accepted political interferences, they accepted this political game between Hargeisa and Garoe, and they even accepted the Puntland control, because for genealogical reasons, I would say, but they never accepted to be militarily occupied by forces coming from Bro. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, has to do with the animosities going back to the 1980s, to the, to the period of Siad Bare, and when most Dulba Hante, one has to say, uh, supported the previous government, and most Isaac supported the Somali national movement, which eventually took control of, of the Northwest. Um, and in this time, like 2007, 2008, Many people uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, in Seoul region and around Buhotle, they were expecting that Ademuse would finally move his troops to challenge Somaliland and to retake Las Arnot, which he never did mm -hmm. for various reasons. Part of it was, I just mentioned, he was concentrated on economic developments in Puntland. Um, and when people in, in the area realized that they basically are left alone and there's no hearty solidarity, 
then they established, then they took the decision to actually establish their own militia. Mm. And there was traditional authorities involved, the Isimada were involved, diaspora actors were involved, um, they funded, they had a conference in London, um, they had a conference in Nairobi, and eventually in 2009, in, in fall 2009, they established what is called Sol Sanak and Ein Administration, SSC, um, led by a guy called Saliban Hakle to see from Buhotle. Um, and this was like a militia. It was a militia group which had the aim to free Las Arnold and all these territories, all the, the area around Buhatle from Somaliland occupation, as they called it. Of course, Hargeisa never called it Somaliland occupation because for them it was always anyway their territory. Yeah. Uh, but from, from a local perspective, it was an occupation. Um, the SSC didn't really succeed, it didn't go anywhere. It, it ended up in a couple of skirmishes with Somaliland national forces in the area around Buhotle and the area around Las Arnold, but it never did any kind of, uh, it never achieved any kind of military victory. And it also had internal complications, there was in internal rivalries. So by 2010, the SSC was defunct. Okay. However, the sentiment was still alive. The sentiment that we are occupied and we are not free and we have been, our land is even taken away. Mm. The sentiment was alive. I was in the region in those days. I was really shocked how, how hate speech started again. Like the clan cleansing topic came up in these times in the area. Mm. If it's correct or not, it's another matter. But people felt really like under pressure and people felt really, were really excited about these issues. Mm. Um, and this was in the time when the, uh, I think there was a Khatumo conference in London and then later on there was a Khatumo conference in Teleh, in the region, um, when they decided, okay, the SSC has, been, uh, has died, but now we have to follow up and though we establish a new administration which is better organized. Khatumo was not, uh, SSC was not really well organized, but Khatumo was then well organized. There was a lot of consultations happening in 2011 in the territory mm -hmm. where traditional authorities, intellectuals, diaspora people, they all visited the area. They talked to so many people in the villages. They said, what do you want? And I think the results of what most people want was to set up their own administration which takes care of peace, which takes care of development, mm. which establishes contacts to Mogadishu and probably also attracts international support. And this was the birth of Khatumo. So you can see Khatumo came about because of the military conflict between Somaliland and Puntland, because of the military occupation of Las Arnot from the Hargeisa side, and because of the neglect of the Puntland leadership of what we can call Hartinimo. <laughs> I have to emphasize, because some people say Khatumo is just a diaspora uh, creation, mm -hmm. which in my perspective is absolutely wrong. Khatumo is the result of a strong sentiment among the local population to change their fate, mm -hmm. to get development, to get peace to their area, and to be their own masters, basically, between Somaliland and Puntland. Mm -hmm. And when there was this federal agenda adopted for, for Somalia, they thought, okay, why don't we become a federal state? I think and in 2011 they were relatively successful after Khatoum had been established, or 2012, uh, I think 2012 in January they had been established. Yeah. So for the first for the first few months, Khatumo entered into a couple of uh, military conflict with Somaliland, but they also really organized themselves relatively well within. They had a real administration with a leadership, with some kind of councils. Um, they uh, tried to establish a good contact to Mogadishu, and so on and so forth. Um, However, um, it also ran into a lot of difficulties recently and Khatumo at the moment, as we speak in early 2014, is again a very weak actor. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, I think the idea still could be that uh, it's part of Somalia, it's part of a federal Somalia. If it's rejoining Puntland, if there, there are some negotiations ongoing or if it's kind of standing for its own, we don't know yet. But yeah. the political decisions are taken actually, I would say, by local actors, by, by, by the traditional authorities in the area and by some diaspora supporters. Okay. Mohammed? <laughs> <laughs>